right, I think we're, uh, we're going to get started. Um, going to try and actually make this a little bit quicker just because we are running behind. And I do want to leave room uh, time for a lot of questions. I like to do that uh, in my talks. So I'm going to try and move through this pretty quickly. Um, same thing with my other talks. If you could hold the questions till the end, uh, that would be really helpful. Uh, all right, so to get started, uh, I'm going to give a talk about Nova Network. Um, and, and primarily, I wanted to do this even though Quantum's here, Quantum is, is, is ready to go in Grizzly, um, there's a lot of people that are still using Nova Network, right? There might be a lot of people deploying Folsom or uh, Grizzly with Nova Network and not Quantum. So I wanted to like spend some time, this might be the last open, or the OpenStack conference where we talk about Nova Network at all, but I wanted to give people some idea of what's actually happening behind the scenes. Uh, if, you've, if you've already, uh, if you've already been running OpenStack for a while, six months, eight months, you probably have already learned most of the things that I'm going to tell you today, but for, for some people there, there may be some information. Uh, so, so like I was saying, Folsom deployments, pre-existing installations, uh, this, hopefully this talk will be, be of use to you. Uh, a lot of the quantum information, I just wanted to provide some links so you know where to find the configuration options, things like that for quantum. It's worth looking into and understanding what quantum is going to bring and how they differ between Nova Network and quantum. Uh, that's not primarily what this talk is going to be for, so uh, those are some of the links you guys can use. These, uh, these slides will be up on SlideShare uh, under slideshare.net, RyanRichard07. They'll also be posted by OpenStack. All right, so what is Nova Network? Quick overview of it. Uh, it basically provides networking for your instances, right? So it is, it is the the piece of OpenStack that says, I'm going to provision an IP from an available pool and I'm going to give it to this instance. It actually does a number of other things behind the scenes, which we'll talk about. So the main, main choices with Nova Network are, are basically flat, flat VLAN, flat DHCP. Uh, flat VLAN and flat DHCP don't, aren't terribly different other than uh, the concept of VLANs are added into it. Right? But, but ultimately they, they function very, in a very similar fashion. Uh, flat, I, I don't know if many people are actually using flat. You don't hear about it too often. Uh, we at Rackspace, or at least with private cloud, we're, we're consuming DHCP uh, until we move to quantum. Uh, the flat DHCP, that is. Uh, whereas flat is, is essentially for injecting uh, your own networking into it. Um, Nova Network is also responsible for handling the uh, most of the IP tables, uh, EV tables, and, and Linux bridge pieces of it. There's other implementations on how things are actually being consumed, but that's, this is what I'm gonna focus on today. It's what I have most of my experience with. Uh, one, one important thing to, to note is that Nova Network doesn't have um, a direct API like Quantum, right? It is actually part of Nova. So all of the calls to it, all the, everything that, that is the configuration options, they all really fall under Nova. Uh, and not, not, it's not a separate major project until Quantum. I mean, that's what Quantum was born out of is because some of the limitations of, of Nova Network you know, needed to be surpassed, right? So that's why Quantum even exists. Um, but it is, there is no direct API. There are Nova API calls for networking specifically, but it is not its own project. Let's see. A uh, quick thing on IP tables. I, I, I did have a slide on this, but I, but I tore it out. Um, just so you guys are aware that there's a lot of IP tables going on at the host le level. Uh, there's about 20 chains uh, in, in use for just the, the natting portion, not even including the, uh, the actual security groups implementation. So just, just in IP tables alone for natting, there's about 20 chains in play, uh, and which can grow immensely the number of rules that are actually in play over time. Quick definition, uh, the way I'm gonna use definitions are, you know, a host network is, is basically the, the network space or interface network space that uh, the Nova compute nodes, the physical machines are going to talk to each, each other on, uh, as well as in, in our case, it's where Nova, the OpenStack process is, and we also manage the machines from, from that network space. Uh, the fixed network is essentially the, the layer three network that instances will get their IPs from. Uh, it is also where instance to instance communication happens. So if you, you certainly have the possibility to run these all in one interface, one VLAN, but if you choose to separate them out, then that is the dedicated interface where instances will communicate to, to each other on. So I wanted to, I, I try to like think about how I wanted to put this in slides and it ends up being really terrible. So 
try to draw pictures and hopefully that will, will make everyone's life a little bit better. So this is, this is an overview of, uh, I don't think anyone wants to stare at IP tables chains all day long. Uh, so hopefully the, the pictures will give some, some, some uh, help. Um, so this is, my, this is my world. This is a small little example network that I have. I'm basically defining that, I'm not really showing interfaces right now, just saying that I sort of have a network space um, and my, my compute nodes and controllers are living on, on this 10 dot network. Um, that's how I communicate with them. I'm also showing that on our compute nodes, we, we chose to run Nova Compute, Nova Network Processes, uh, as well as the meta, metadata and, and DNS mask on every compute node. DNS mask is what's responsible for handling all the DHCP for instances. So when an instance boots up, does a DHCP request, its local DNS mask is gonna respond and say, your IP is X, your default route is this, and your host name is, is Y. Uh, one, in, one interesting thing to note is that Nova Network, uh, the Nova Network on your local um, compute node doesn't necessarily, is, is not necessarily the one responsible for responding to a Nova Network API call. Um, so if you have different Nova configurations on different nodes, you could actually, that could cause some serious confusion because a Nova Network process running on a different node could be the one that responds, actually provisions the IP. Uh, so that, that's something worth noting. All right, so initially when, uh, when I'm, I'm booting an instance, first thing that happens, uh, say this is a, a extremely new environment, I boot an instance, first thing that's gonna happen is the compute node actually needs an IP for itself uh, that's gonna act as the gateway for your instances. So it's gonna, it's gonna uh, you know, make a series of calls uh, and get an IP provisioned out of the fixed network uh, and that will be stored in the, data, in the same database. There's a very specific database field, the host field, that is going to actually have the host name of the compute node and, and really no other information in it. The second step in the process is gonna create the bridge. It's gonna put the interface in the bridge that you've specified. Um, and I'm not really specifying one here. I'm just, I'm just saying that, that that's the process that it takes. It's also gonna assign the IP from the fixed network that it chose in the database to the bridge. It's also you know, gonna set up some initial IP tables, EV tables, um, some rules to prevent uh, some, some spoofing. I'm gonna actually go into these a little bit, a little bit more later. But the, the IP tables, the security groups, and the NAT rules, they're all actually running on the compute host, not, not within the instances themselves. So that's, that's worth, worth being aware of. Um, oh, just so you know, that the, the space that I the, defined here for my fixed VMs is the 192.168.168 space. So once my instances are created, uh, it's gonna set up some additional security groups, which are also IP tables rules on the compute host. Uh, and by default, uh, when OpenStack deploys, it's, it's an extremely restrictive model, it, nothing's allowed, right? Um, next step in the process, uh, the instance is going to send a DHCP request and it's gonna get a response from uh, DNS mask running on its machine. DNS mask is gonna know, it's gonna keep uh, data about uh, you know, all the instances that are running and what their MAC, their MAC address for their virtual NICs and their IP address. And then we have our instances up. Uh, you know, the instance is gonna get, it's the first available IP out of the fixed range uh, and its gateway is actually going to be the IP on the bridge from the compute node. Uh, that's something worth, you know, making sure you're really aware of. Uh, again, a lot of people have probably realized this if you're running already, but it's something that most people don't don't understand initially. Um, there are, are options on actually to do this a different way, which I'll, I'll talk about later. This is kind of the standard uh, default way though. Actually, I guess, does anyone have any questions? I, I said we could wait till the end, but just about this setup or what's going on here? Any initial questions? No, okay. forwarding for like an application in an instance or so oh to go outside so for an instance so instance to the world okay so from here if an instance is going to talk to the world uh, it's it's going to go through its default gateway which is the compute host there's an automatic uh, there's an automatic rule put in place uh, in the IP tables NAT chain that says when I my traffic is destined for something that is not another instance 
I'm gonna get natted to the IP of the compute host, and then it's gonna get sent out its default gateway of the actual physical server. Um, so in this world, if I were talking to Google, um, I would, you know, from VM1, I would get natted at the compute host, and I would appear to be coming from 10.0.0.3, and I would go out whatever default gateway that compute host has, assuming you don't have some other route in place. Um, so there's not actually a need for port forwarding. Um, OpenStack handles that for you. All right, so as far as options go, I, I tried to count the number of options uh, possible. It's, it's 50 plus, I'm sure it's, it's actually much higher than that. Um, uh, once you really start getting into it, that's not even including any of the quantum options. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of ways to customize how this looks and there's not really any way I could go through all of them realistically and, and tell you what each and every single one of them means. So it's worth noting that with anything in OpenStack, uh, it's, it's extremely customizable for your needs. So make sure you look into it before you try and build one. Uh, we run multi-host everywhere. It's just a way of, of basically, when, so you're not having one, uh, one machine act as your gateway for all your instances. Multi-host is basically what runs Nova Network everywhere. It allows your gateway to be the compute host. And basically, you don't have a single point of failure. Um, obviously, if that compute host goes down, those instances lose their gateway, but you know, the, the host is down anyways. Uh, some of the other major options I'm gonna talk about real quick are some of the DNS stuff, the DHCP options, uh, what public interface is and what DMZ CIDR is. Uh, public interface as an option basically decides which interface the default SNAP rule is gonna apply. So that's the, the rule that I was mentioning uh, when your traffic is leaving your instance. Uh, if it's destined for somewhere else that OpenStack doesn't know about, there's a default SNAP rule. Uh, that, that public interface basically says, watch, you know, apply this rule to this interface um, and that, that's that's what, uh, you're gonna have to set that. Uh, specifically, yes. Uh, well, default, if you don't set that, it defaults to E0. So, uh, but when you do set it, it affects the chain. I just put this in here just so you guys, you know, go back and look at these chains. The specific chain it affects is called Nova Network SNAT. It's, the rule there is automatically there. Uh, if you do not set public interface, it'll, it'll watch E0. Uh, it's also, it's also responsible for, uh, or excuse me, you want to associate it with the interface that can reach the internet. Uh, so, you know, if each zero is, is the one that can reach out to the world, that's that's probably what you're gonna want to set public interface to. Uh, well, so we, we the NovaConf runs, in a, in a, we have the same NovaConf everywhere, but this is for Nova Network. So wherever Nova Network is running, that meet that, configuration option needs to be there. So which is probably your compute node. Yeah, yeah so I, I explained earlier, basically the default SNAP rule says that for any traffic not destined for another instance, uh, or if it's not in the DMZ CIDR, SNAP that traffic, and make it look like it's coming from the compute node. Some of the DNS mask options, again, I, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I just kinda wanna explain some of the, some of the bigger ones that you might look at. Uh, DHCP lease time, obviously people are gonna wanna customize that. There's an option for that. Uh, the big one is, the, the interesting one that, that we've done for a few customers is the hardware gateway option, uh, which, is, which is kinda neat. So it basically says use a real gateway device uh, somewhere further up in the network, not don't use my compute node. Um, so whether it's router or something else. Um, uh, you know, you, you have the ability to do that. You can do it with v VLAN mode as well. So you may want to look into it. There are certainly caveats to, to doing it that way, but, but it's uh, one way of, you know, some of our customers that have done this is because they wanted to ma maintain routes to other parts of their infrastructure. And so, otherwise you'd have to do it on every compute node, right? If you wanted to have spe special routes to reach some other backend network, uh, you'd have to do it on every compute node. If you point to a, like a hardware gateway device that knows about those routes, you then don't have to maintain those in a bunch of different places. Uh, sorry, I didn't, I don't follow. So, you know how you were saying that you get mad out for having that in the end of the Right. But if you don't use that as a gateway, the hardware gateway, do you not and not know that you're using it? So, if you're using a hardware gateway, uh, you basically need to tell OpenStack not to apply that rule. Um, and then further up, you need to deal with that in some way. 
So you need to you need to deal with the fact that your instances may not. So if, if it's public space and I'm not getting added to something that has internet access, like your router, I have to, you know, a pad or something out there to basically say, to, to do what Nova's trying to do for you. Um, but if you do point it to a hardware gateway device, you basically need to stop Nova from doing that automatic snap rule. Because else it's, it's, it's going to say, oh, you're trying to reach this other network I don't know about, and it's going to try and get snatted, and you, that's probably not what you want. Um, I'm going to tell you how to do that right now, actually. Uh, well, actually, D, uh, DNS mask also, just so you guys are aware, uh, by default, it forwards all DNS queries to whatever the underlying hypervisor uh, installation has set. It will just forward those queries on. Um, so that's just one thing to, to take note. All right, so DMZ CIDR is exactly what I was just talking about just now. Uh, it is basically a NAT exclusion list. Uh, it is an accept rule in your IP tables NAT chain. It is actually a bunch of accept rules. So as you grow this, that, that chain gets longer and it's more accept rules. Um, it is further up in the process uh, than before some of the SNAT rules get applied. So basically it says if my destination is you know, some other network, right? don't perform that SNAT. I don't want you to form, perform that SNAT. So maybe that's the other end of a VPN, right? Or maybe it's just some other network in, in your data center that you want access to. Uh, if you want to look at what is set for your for your installation, that's the chain to look at, the Nova Network post routing chain. All right, let's see. So the IP tables, um, it's basically not talking, so it is responsible for that. I've been talking about that a lot. It's also responsible for security groups. So when you define a security group in Nova, it stores it in the database. When you boot an instance, it applies very specific IP tables rules uh, to that compute host to limit access to your instances. Uh, default, like I mentioned earlier, is restrict everything. And an example, if you look at your IP tables rules, it's going to be Nova, compute, instance, and then the instance ID in decimal, not hexadecimal. So there's just one thing if you're trying to figure out which instance to look at. Take the instance ID and convert it. That's where it's going to be. Some of the, the default EB, EB table stuff, at least in the Libra implementation, does IP, MAC, ARP spoofing. doesn't let you assign multiple IPs inside an instance. Um, it, it's trying to prevent you doing that. You know, it's really following the public cloud model where people aren't going to be able to have multiple IPs inside of an instance. Uh, it's, it's basically there for protection. You can, you can actually break these. Um, the, the directory is Etsy Libra uh, you know, NW filter if you want. Um, I don't necessarily recommend it, but you can turn off all these protections if you really wanted to. And then floating IPs is, is one of the, the you know, final things I'm really going to talk about is floating IP pools are extremely easy to add. You can define them on the fly. Um, they, they must be associated with the public interface, though. Uh, you don't really have an option right now, or at least in Nova Network, to, to have them go out some other interface. So they have to be accessible on whatever you've defined as your public interface. Uh, don't, they don't actually get assigned inside the instance. I think that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions about floating IPs. They don't get assigned inside the instance. They are actually SNAT and DNAT rules. Well, it's a combination of it gets assigned to the compute host, and then it's a combination of DNAT and SNAT rules that, that get applied on the compute host to make, the, make it happen. They're dynamic in that I can apply them to an instance. You know, I, can, I can assign it to an instance. I can unassign it, assign it to another instance to, to make them dynamic. So let's say I have a, in this, in this model, I've added a floating IP of 10.0.0.203 to my bridge on Computo 1. Uh, that's where my floating IP is actually going to be assigned. So if you, you know, if you assign a floating IP and you're like, why, you know, why didn't, why my instance, nothing changed. It's because if you look on your compute host, you look on the bridge, uh, that's where it's going to be. And then the snap rules are what affect traffic flow, right? So Traffic flow coming into the instance is going to hit a, a destination at rule that says anything destin you know traffic that was for ten zero zero two or three uh, you know you know getting added to to the IP of the fixed IP and then vice versa going out an instance so that means traffic from an instance is now going to look like it's coming from a floating IP instead of the fixed IP um, the DMZ cider is the exception there so it, it, again if you set DMZ cider rules they're except they are accept rules further higher up in the chains and they'll affect flow. Um, 
Let's see. And then uh, finally, integrating with your existing network. This is the biggest headache we run into, I think, is that it's actually really difficult to do, um, mainly because you have to define your, your fixed IP space. You say, well, I'm, I think I may have 2,000 IPs at some point. I need to define the correct network. Um, a lot of companies you know, don't like that. They don't like having to define the like 4,000 or 2,000 IPs that can only be consumed here at some point in the future. Right? So it is kind of difficult. And it, a lot of people want to know about integration with their, their existing IPAM. The problem there is that OpenStack really is uh, IPAM. So it wants to know everything about networking. Like it wants to decide everything. Um, so in trying to integrate with one of your existing ones is, is going to be a headache. I'm not sure if anyone's successfully doing that real well or not. Um, but it doesn't handle all the things you expect IPAM to handle like DNS. Um, so just, just uh, be aware that of, of kind of what's going on there. Um, all right, and then some example architectures. Basically, um, you know, this, is, this is one that we use pretty commonly. Uh, is, is, you know, I'm running my fixed, my management on one interface, and floating IPs are pretty much all running on one interface. It's a pretty standard looking, looking uh, environment. And then uh, another common setup that we see is where you essentially have a dedicated interface for, uh, you know, for your fixed. So for instance, in instance communications happening, dedicated interface, um, and all management traffic's happening on, you know, say, uh, EP0 versus EP1. And then uh, w one thing I did mention in my other talks is really another common use case is there's going to be connection between the sender nodes and the compute nodes for maybe like 10, 10 gigabit throughput or something like that if you needed quicker. But this isn't a sender <coughs> talk, but it's certainly part of the networking overall um, thoughts. All right, so that's pretty much it. Uh, just open to, to questions now. Yeah? It, so it doesn't work when you assign it to a compute? I, I mean, that, that's probably a specific implementation. Like, we'd have to sit down and look at it. It's probably too hard to try and troubleshoot up here. Yeah. Uh, no, so uh, this is not actually, that's, that's a good question. This, my traffic's not flowing through the controller. I'm really just trying to say that they're all in the same VLAN. Um, but my, my traffic's not flowing through my controller. Um, we, don't, we don't run the controller as a compute node, so we don't have bridges. Um, the, the controller is a different model. It just needs accessibility to your, to your compute nodes doesn't actually need to be able to reach your instances, right? It's, it's responsible for the control plane, not, not actual stuff going on inside the instances. Yeah, so the, uh, the floating IP's pool will be stored in the database on the controller, but when you actually assign it, the work is done by the compute node. So the, the controller tells the compute node, you need to assign this floating IP to this instance, the Nova compute process, Nova network processes will go to work and make that happen. Uh, I am. Yeah, I, I did talk about that earlier. I am assuming that multi-host is, is turned on and you're running Nova network uh, on all your compute nodes and not in a single point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes? Yeah, it's because it's the there's uh, that's all happening before the VLANs come into play, right? So yeah, uh, and, and and that's I I'm not sure Evan is it there's a, a flag that you can set that will not allow that, right? Right. 
I think it's a, like a lack of accept rules. It's, I, I think there's a default behavior in setting that flag actually re, like remove. Yeah, we don't, we don't run VLAN mode, so. Yeah. I, I don't think there's another session, so we can probably just keep asking questions, unless you guys want to go eat food. I gotta have that up too. It, you can based on how your networking set up. So you, you, you can define any number of floating IP pools. They're really easy to add after the fact. Um, but if, um, right, but they're not, yeah, it's routing further up. But if your network lets you do that, then, then so be it. So commonly we actually assign multiple pools and we actually mat them at the firewall to like uh, um, uh, some private IP. Uh, and then that, that way it just lets us assign new pools extremely easily. So it doesn't even really need to know about different network spaces. Yeah, but you can, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know, well, I don't know about Havana, right? Havana's six months away, but Gri in Grizzly, I believe it is. Uh, OpenStack tends to let deprecated stuff last for two or three releases. Um, so it is still an option. And then I believe, I haven't looked into it, but I believe Quantum allows you, Evan might know this, also, but I believe quantum allows you to mimic the exact same behavior um, that Nova Network will do if you want just a very basic out of the box thing. And I, there was an initial talk that would let you actually use Nova Network as like the plug into quantum, so it was really doing the work. I don't know if that actually made it in or not. I don't know, some other people might know. Uh, yeah. I think so, yes. Um, it, it also depends, yes, it is. Uh, it is, it is much different in the design, and then the idea of vendors come into play, which changes everything as well. Um, which is why I didn't want to focus on it, because it's a completely different talk. Um, and different architecture, different design, all of it. And then depending on the vendor that you choose, or if you don't choose a vendor and use OBS, that's a different design, right? It's, it's, it's big, yeah. No, quantum's big. Uh, yeah, back there in the back. problem? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I don't think we've run into that yet. And we have some customers running a significant number of instances. Um, but certainly, uh, there were in the past, like in Essex, there was some pretty serious performance problems if you're using like a lot of security groups that were sourcing other security groups. Um, that was, that was, used to be a performance issue. Um, you know, now I, I, I don't know the answer, to be honest. Um, I, it's, it's no different than, than regular IP tables, so at some number of chains and rules, they're gonna start to impact performance, yeah. Um, but even customers running you know, 30 VMs on a host haven't really, uh, they haven't complained about it, so we, we haven't hit that limit yet. No. Uh, Sorry, say that again. So, no, no, it it will the interface the interface will be in the bridge and the IP for the fixed IP will still be inside the instance. Um, but at that point, if you've uh, set up the, your DMZ CIDR appropriately, your compute node is essentially on the wire through the bridge, and the the host is really not doing anything besides performing like uh, IP table security groups. So you're, you'll communicate directly through the bridge to the, the hardware gateway device, assuming it's, it's accessible on that VLAN, right? So. Um, you mentioned earlier EV tables um, prevent your VM from using more than one IP. Now is that, <coughs> so in essence, if you were to go into that VM and assign a secondary IP within the instance, that prevents it from the talking to the gateway? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you can, you could certainly put one in there, but it's just not, the compute right. node's not gonna let you do anything with it. Right. I actually think, well, if you do, the, the you might be able to communicate with all other instances on that yeah. compute node, but, but basically you need to break those, those restrictions if you wanna do that. Okay. So where that's come up is people trying to do traditional HA 
on here, right? And they need floating IPs, but they want traditional floating IPs and like get assigned by like Pacemaker or whatever, um, and not OpenStack floating IPs. Um, but you can't do that because you need two IPs inside that instance, and uh, you can't do that with the, with these restrictions. So uh, I know some people have looked at actually writing fencing mechanisms that that talk to OpenStack and move a, a OpenStack floating IP across. Um, but there's you know do, just trying to do traditional HA, it gets yeah it's kind of in, in, in our instance too, like if you were to just port like uh, say you convert a physical web server into a VM and then put it inside OpenStack. Well, traditionally, like our web servers that have multiple IPs on them. Right. And so that would be a use case for us. But yeah. So you're saying that's, you, you said that was under so the web uh, in W filter. filter. Okay. Now, with Nomad Network, you can do that, basically, unless you break those. Uh, but with Quantum, you can. So, um, you know, the, 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 I didn't really touch on Quantum at all, but it, but it is a, a huge step forward in networking, right? Yeah, like we, we tried that with Quantum and it didn't, it didn't take, like the gateway didn't help to it. The setting of a that second IP. Yeah, that might be a implementation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a quantum workshop there. Oh, in here? So, that, so that's worth bringing up. Yeah, that, that, that's worth noting. I didn't talk on that at all, but, but you could certainly define multiple fixed networks, and every time you boot an instance, you get an IP from all those networks, yeah. and that will work. Yeah, that was what Evan brought up. You can do that. You can even you can even do some things like you can do that, and when you're spinning up an instance, tell it to use this network instead of this network, so you can kind of get some some of the quantum functionality. But the dashboard doesn't respect that, so right. you'd have to always use the API or CLI if you wanted to do something like that. Other questions? I think. I would, I mean, I would go with Quantum Grizzly forward no matter what, just because that's the way OpenStack's going. Into the into the VLAN, yeah. I, I, there's there's so many ways of building these. Like it's it's actually kind of. Right. Yeah. I, you know, we we chose like I said, we chose flat DHCP as our standard until we moved to quantum. Um, and any basically just what Evan said. If we have to deal with with VLANs, and then that's the direction we would go. We we tag them on the interface and. Uh, put that into a separate bridge. Who else? Anything? More questions? You got one? All right. Thanks, guys.